What's up, everyone? We're back. Dr. Maxfield. Dr. Shaw. Welcome back to our channel, Doctorly, where we talk about all things skincare and dermatology. Today, we're going to focus on a particular brand, actually. We, we don't do this probably often enough, but today is going to be The Ordinary. So we're going to be talking about the best of The Ordinary. We get a lot of questions about The Ordinary, I think because it's so affordable. Um, it's an option that a lot of people have access to. And so we're going to talk about some of our favorite products from The Ordinary. This video is not sponsored by The Ordinary. They do send us products. Products. So I guess there's some bias there, but a lot of companies send us products and we're not so nice to those companies either. <laughs> so uh, at the end of the day, um, these are genuine reviews of the products and we'll tell you what the best of the ordinary is. All right, best of the ordinary. Here we go. Here we go. All right, first up, let's talk about their lactic acid solution. So they have one that's a 5% and they have another one that's 10%. It's compounded with hyaluronic acid to give increased hydration. So I actually like almost all of the acids from The Ordinary. And the reason why is because they're so affordable compared to other options out there. And they just tell you exactly what they are. They're like, this is 10% lactic acid. Um, this is 5% lactic acid. They also have a mandelic acid that I really like for people with sensitive skin. Um, and I also like The Ordinary Peeling Solution, which has a 30% um, AHA and the 2% BHA. And we've talked about this in a prior video, so you can learn more about that there. We've also talked about exfoliation in general and how to pick an exfoliant per your skin type. Uh, but in general, this is a product that I like a lot because it's tough to find a lactic acid solution that's just lactic acid by itself. And I like lactic acid because it both moisturizes and exfoliates at the same time. So it's great for people with dry skin. It's great for people with combination skin. Yeah, I agree. You know, I, they're, they have a lot of acids actually, and it's a nice arm of their brand. Um, you know, with lactic acid here, it is nice. The peeling solution is really nice, really straightforward. I like the color of it. I mean, everybody does, right? But I like that you can see where it goes, you know, if you miss a spot or, you know, if you get a little too close to your eye or somewhere you don't want it. So the lactic acid solution, great option. These exfoliants in general, actually, this is one of the few things that you're going to see pretty immediate results from, though, I think. It's going to improve that dullness, I'd say, I don't know, after one treatment, two treatments. It's really quick. It's a great product to improve your skin texture, help your makeup layer better, and just immediately increase your skin dewiness, radiance, glass skin appearance. You yeah, know, thanks for a lot this, of, by the way. <laughs> a lot of people gave me different adjectives for dewiness in our last video, so um, it will help with that. So how I would use this, you can actually use this during the day. I prefer to use my acids at night. So what I do is I cleanse, I apply my lactic acid, and then I just moisturize over the top of it. I mean, it's quite simple. That's just my entire night routine, and then I and then I go to sleep. Yeah, and then this is something you would use on a day you're not going to be using your retinoid or other irritating uh, ingredients. This can be like a special once a week exfoliant treat. Right. And you could use this with the retinoid. Like I, I want to stress, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more detail, that a lot of these people, or a lot of these videos you'll see where I say, you can't use this with this, and you can't use this with this. There's really no science behind that, but I am on the board of people that say, okay, like you don't want to use too many irritating ingredients in the same routine at the same time, because that's going to compound the irritation. So I wouldn't use it with a retinoid, but you theoretically could use it with a retinoid. Right, we actually get that question so often, like can I use X and X, and if the limiting factor is irritation and you're not getting irritation, I mean, then okay. There are ingredients that do cancel each other out, and we'll talk more about that in a different video, but this is not one of those ingredients that's gonna be canceled out by another ingredient. Yeah, uh, so this one's interesting to me personally. Uh, this is the caffeine solution 5% with the EGCG, which is a kind of catechin or green tea component. The reason this is so interesting to me is this is supposed to uh, reduce the appearance of eye contour, pigmentation, and puffiness, but could it do so much more? Yes, yeah, so I like caffeine a lot, and I like green tea extracts a lot. As a matter of fact, I've talked about green tea before. We'll probably do a whole video on green tea because I just don't think it's probably underhyped. Um, green tea actually has tremendous benefits for the skin and the hair, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that in another video, but this has both of them together. Um, I actually like this as a depuffing agent um, in the morning because it does cause vasoconstriction. Some people are argue that it also causes vasodilation, but ultimately it causes, it constricts the blood vessels. Constricting the blood vessels can help with puffiness. And so using this around the eyes can help with people that have puffiness in the morning. And then there's some other uses for it as well. So he touched on the fact that caffeine might be understood in hair loss. And you're like, wait, what? Yeah, it actually might be able to do this. Now, you have to do this early with, as with most hair loss treatments, but the caffeine can inhibit an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, which converts testosterone into like a more active version called dihydrotestosterone. Not only does caffeine do that, but also the EGCG might do that as well. 
And the other benefit is caffeine is actually super well absorbed. It's actually concentration independent. So regardless of the concentration, it's actually the quantity that you put on that's going to dictate how well it's absorbed in your skin. And that's important because it actually could absorb deeper into your skin where the hair follicles actually sit. Yeah. And there's actually some studies that came out of the British Journal of Dermatology um, saying that caffeine can actually stimulate hair growth in people that have male or female pattern hair loss or androgenetic alopecia, which we'll do a whole video on, but it's one of the natural ingredients that I do like for hair loss. Now in shampoos, there was some studies showing that shampoos could be beneficial for hair loss, but ultimately caffeine shampoos, it's going to wash out. It's not going to sit on the scalp as long. I would prefer a leave-on treatment. Now, this is not marketed for the hair, but it could have benefits for the hair. Yeah, and it's not going to grow hair, by the way, if you're putting it here, because it's going to specifically act on those hair follicles that you would already have, like here and here, that are susceptible to that hormonal hair loss. So topical caffeine, uh, decreased puffiness, the EGCG can also act as an antioxidant, and then you just have the fun added play, you know, maybe this could work as a hair loss solution too. And also maybe cellulite. Oh, oh we're going there. Okay, so so the caffeine can help with cellulite in theory. Let's start with why it does and I'll tell you why it's not. So why might it help with this? So there is some evidence that caffeine can work as like an anti-cellulite treatment. It can increase the breakdown of fat cells. It can decrease the accumulation of fat cells that are occurring underneath the skin in people that have cellulite. Is it gonna be a miracle? I mean, there are some studies showing it does have benefit, but what do you think? So here's why cellulite is such a frustrating problem. Like, so let's say it actually does shrink the fat cells. And like there's an ultrasound study that says it might, but the problem with cellulite and what causes cellulite is actually herniation of the fat through like these defects within your skin and structural components of the skin. And so while it can shrink the skin, it's okay, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. It's like it can shrink the moles, but the holes are still there. So they can still pop out and pooch out. So this is why it's difficult to treat. It's probably not gonna be a miracle treatment for this, but it might help subtly. Yeah, and ultimately 90% of people have cellulite. So it's something where, you know, it's not something that like, a lot of times you'll see photos of people that don't have cellulite. A lot of times that's like retouching, to be honest. I just, these are one of those things I wanna stress. There's a few things that I'll stress as being very normal uh, for people and cellulite is one of those things where it's very normal to have cellulite. I have cellulite, it's normal. Overall, very interesting ingredient list, very interesting product, good for around the eyes, just just very interesting combination for everything. I don't think it's gonna be like a miracle for any particular issue, but I think it'd be something interesting to layer into your skincare routine and will layer well with other ingredients. And so it's a nice thing to have. It's very affordable, like all products from the ordinary. And so I think it's worth giving it a shot. All right, so next up, the azelaic acid suspension from the ordinary here. And we've talked about azelaic acid before. It's one of my favorite ingredients. So we'll probably do a whole video on it, but it has so many different benefits from decreasing acne. It's an acne treatment. It has level A or grade A evidence in the treatment of acne, um, but it also helps with hyperpigmentation by decreasing the enzyme tyrosinase. So basically, amazing ingredient, azelaic acid. Now, azelaic acid, when you get it as a prescription in the 15 to 20% range from your doctor can cost like hundreds of dollars, whereas you can get it in the 10% range, which doesn't have as many studies on it, but it's probably still gonna be pretty beneficial for you. Um, so this is a great product. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. So the subjective portion of this, like does this feel nice? I actually don't mind it, especially for the price. I, I think it kind of feels like a moisturizer. Um, some complaints you were saying, yeah, it can be a little bit gritty. Um, I think so people that have tried the product out uh, notice that it has a little bit of a gritty texture to it. And um, some people just don't like that. It can have like almost like a pilling effect. I don't really notice it much um, and I don't really layer a lot of products together. So I do like three or four step routine maximum. And so I don't really get a lot of pilling in my skincare routine yeah. in general. I think the more you layer, the more you pill. And so I just use this as a once a day or a twice a day product. And I don't use it with a lot of other ingredients. I do the same way. The other side here, though, he mentioned this, is that most of the studies are done 15 to 20%. And so in all candor, I actually do use 10% for some of my patients. I think it's a good option for people. So this is actually kind of like a consideration of mine. So let's say you have a company who does the study with 15% to prove that azelaic acid is effective. And then you have these over-the-counter products who are like, oh, thank you so much for doing this research. I tell you what, I'm going to make a 10% azelaic acid and I'm going to undersell you. So I actually love that they bring this to people. I love that they help it make people have access to it. But at the back of my mind, I'm like, it's kind of shady how this is just how the over-the-counter product world, the world does this sometimes. They'll like look at someone who's done the research and then basically bid $1 lower 
more on the prices right and say this might do the same thing for half the cost. Well, we're not sure. Yeah, that's true. I think that we do need to fund research. It's very expensive to do research. But then on the flip side, there is like there needs to be like a middle ground because some of the market, some of the things that pharmaceutical companies do is like make things outrageously expensive, like insane. Like a product will be out at a certain price for like a long time. It's like 50 bucks. And then just one day a company acquires and it's like now this is six thousand dollars. And it's like this is not even reasonable behavior. Right. But they have a monopoly or they, they own the trademark or whatever, whatever. And then you can't use it. So so there's like this pharmaceutical companies are not necessarily innocent in the whole process, unfortunately. And so you kind of have this push and pull where we need to fund these companies because they do a lot of the research. Uh, but at the same time, there is a little bit of profit taking that is maybe a little excessive. Um, and so I agree. I think that we do need to be funding companies that are doing the ground research. Yeah, it's kind of a give and take, you know, not sure where the balance is, but just some considerations, food for thought. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. So the next one is the niacinamide 10% with the zinc 1%. And probably no surprise that I'm doing something with niacinamide. I've fallen in love over the last couple of years. But here's why I like it. And I'll tell you why I don't like it later too. Niacinamide is an ingredient that's just super well-rounded. So like it's super balanced. It can be helpful uh, for sensitive skin. It can be helpful for acne. It can be helpful for dispigmentation. The mechanisms are kind of extensive and kind of nuanced, but it has just so many roles that you can plug it into most skincare routines. It helps with acne. Normalizes oil production. Normalizes oil production, which is actually a really rare feature. The zinc here, is kind of just along for the ride in my opinion like even with acne topical zinc was in our like question mark category i think not great evidence um probably has some antioxidant properties but beyond that not a super active topical ingredient um but you already know like why why is why would i have a problem with niacin in my 10 percent <laughs> Yeah, and we've talked about this before. We actually introduced this topic like almost over a year now at this point yeah. uh, in our first niacinamide video was that when we were doing all the research on niacinamide and put that video together, uh, what we found was that there have been no studies in niacinamide over 5%. And so all the studies showing all these tremendous benefits of niacinamide, which we love so much, have been done in concentrations between 2 and 5%. But then we saw all these skincare companies putting out products like 10%, 15%, 20%. They're like in a race to the top. We even have a hundred percent niacinamide powder, you know? So ultimately, how much do you really need between two and 5%? And so I think that, and I believe this truly, the higher percentage you go, I think people get this idea, higher percentage means more effective, better. When I see higher percentages, I think higher irritancy potential, higher risk of irritation and increases your risk of this product. It's true. And so here, actually, so there's some fun with these numbers a little bit. Uh, the reason that these companies cap out around 20% by by the way, is that a lot of the safety studies were done and showed that there's like this irritation potential and it kind of plateaus around 20%. And so like once you hit that 20% threshold, like the irritation probably outweighs the net benefit of these ingredients. But again, all of the efficacy was done at like two and 4%. And here actually, the reason I like this in some form though, niacinamide is ultra stable. So if you're gonna plug and play with an ingredient, this water soluble niacinamide powder is probably the one you would be able to like most effectively make a mask out of, out of or like an oil moisturizing balm or something. But you don't need that 100%. You need to dilute this like 20 fold. Yeah, so you'd have to do this 20 to one to get it to be about 5%. You can mix it with a moisturizer potentially. I don't like, I, I just think that DIY, some of the stuff you can end up worse off than when you started. <laughs> but if you're very meticulous about it, like you would be about cooking, you could probably put together a decent mask with the niacinamide. However, they do have like an L-ascorbic acid powder that I would like not recommend using because it's not a very stable ingredient. And so I don't know how eff efficacious it would be um, in that form, but the niacinamide one if you're really good at DIY may be beneficial yeah and that's kind of the ordinary for me like that's kind of what the, I think about with the ordinary it's like ingredient 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 build your own skincare routine I feel like they really made their niche and made a name for himself that way yeah it's just like single ingredients and so if you learn about an ingredient and that's the one that you want to seek out you're most likely going to find that ingredient within the ordinary lineup <laughs> so that you can use it in your skincare routine. So I do like that. And I, I like, I'm gonna double down on the affordability. Um, I think that it makes it like democratize the skincare because it makes it accessible to everyone. All right, next up is the Ordinary Salicylic Acid 2% Mask. Now, 
Why do I like this product? I actually don't like masks in general because I find they're kind of cumbersome to use because you gotta like put them on and wash them off. I prefer leave-on products because I'm kind of lazy with my skincare. I have like the laziest skincare routine, but ultimately <laughs> the way that I like to use this is more of like as a mask. So you leave it on for about 10 minutes and then you wash it off. Why do I like it? Because it's great for people with acne prone skin, with oily skin, uh, with any blemishes. It really is good. It has a lot of ingredients that are hydrating in it, but also has that salicylic acid at the two percent. It's really going to penetrate deep into your pores to get into those sebaceous glands to help to get rid of acne, to help get rid of sebaceous filaments, which a lot of people have on the nose, they'll notice makes their pores look larger. So I think it's something nice to do maybe once or a week or once every other week. I agree. And I think salicylic acid really is a unique ingredient. And especially in this mask form or leave on form, I just think it provides a lot of benefits that you don't get from other ingredients. So I like this product. I like what it does for you. I think it will deliver. And you know, actually what I love most about this it like doesn't say too much you know it says formulated for blemish prone skin the end <laughs> like <laughs> yeah they don't go into too much detail um it is actually black on this mask so it's pretty cool so you know it has that sort of color appeal to it so you can kind of see where it's going you can actually use this as like a spot treatment for like blemishes acne in general um i wouldn't leave it on for more than like 20 minutes for like that reason but um what you could do is you could use it as a spot treatment and then sort of wash it off and then it will have that benefit fit of being a spot treatment, then you can follow it with maybe a pimple patch. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so good, good, good option, a very affordable option, a nice mask. It's, if I was going to do a mask, it'd probably be this one. Mm. So Alpha Arbutin just lost out to retinol and squalane. This is the retinol 0.5% in squalane. So we know what retinols do. They yeah, we couldn't do a video without <laughs> mentioning retinol. I mean, it's like, <laughs> a good point. It was like getting, it was, it was starting to feel like palpitations because we hadn't mentioned retinol at this point. <laughs> so we had to drop a retinol and they have a lot of options from the ordinary. So they have grand active retinoids, they have retinols in different concentrations. Today, we're going to be highlighting the 0.5% of one. <laughs> So we know what retinoids do. They help treat acne, they build collagen, treat dispigmentation and photoaging, and they do this consistently. But the squalane here is the interesting counterplay. So squalane, which is like a derivative of squalene, this actually functions both as a really good antioxidant and has some antitumoral properties through that, and also helps moisturize both as a humectant and as an emollient. So I like it because it complements the antioxidant portion of the retinoid, plus it kind of helps give this moisturizing effect to kind of offset some of the irritation. So Overall, my opinion of this is like a good starter retinoid. Concentration is low and it has this nice moisturizer. Interesting story about squalene actually for me. So sometimes like you don't know why you like a product. Uh, by the way, I have black all over my hands from the <laughs> um, from that last product. But squalene, interesting story for me because sometimes you don't know like why you like a product particularly. And what I started to notice actually was that a lot of my favorite moisturizers have squalene in them. And what I started to realize was that maybe it's it's the squalane that I like mm. about these products a lot. And so squalane actually turns out to be one of my favorite skin oils. But anyway, what do you think? Overall, I think a great starter retinoid for people. A wonderful starter retinoid for a lot of people. Affordable, does the job, gets the job done. You know, retinol has a lot of evidence behind it. You know, it's converted to retinoic acid or retinaldehyde and then retinoic acid um, and to function within the cells. And it's very, very effective for anti-aging and for hyperpigmentation and so many different things. We love retinol. This is just another great affordable option. I think that rounds it out. So that sums up some of our favorite products from The Ordinary. Now, if you don't have some of the skin problems that we mentioned in this video for these particular products, you don't need these products. Don't just buy them because they're affordable. I know a lot of people that buy like a hundred products from The Ordinary and then they end up not using them, but be very specific. Like if you need an exfoliant and you have dry skin, you may want to try the lactic acid exfoliant. If you have acne, you may want to try the salicylic acid mask. But And if you have hair loss, you may want to try the caffeine. <laughs> solution. So this, you got to be very deliberate, like we always say, but these are great products. They're affordable products. And we'll highlight some more of our favorite products. And then I think we should probably do a video on some of the worst products from the ordinary that we don't like. Yeah, that's fair. I almost like don't want to hate on them too much because I think I'm, I'm kind of proud of what they do in a way. But we'll always take the time to give both counterpoints for everything we do, really. Yeah, I think I think they get a little confusing when it comes to their vitamin C options. <laughs> and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that at some point. But uh, there are things that I've not been too impressed with, but overall, I think it's a good brand. Yeah, it is. And maybe that's where you'll get the vitamin C. Pick. We always like start off these sessions, like, okay, what are we gonna do video on? Like, have we done vitamin C yet? No, we haven't. Let's, let's, save, let's save that for later. <laughs> so maybe that's where we'll do this vitamin C deep dive. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And thank you for joining us on this journey. Yep. We always appreciate it and appreciate
appreciate you. Where does the pigment come from? Like, where are the colors coming um, from? These things. Charcoal. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, I'll just leave that. Continue. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit more about that in another video. But this has both of them together. Um, I actually like this as a depuffing agent um, in the morning because it does cause vasoconstriction. Some people are. <laughs>